Um, so, so I've been a prion researcher for the last seven years, and I've uh, worked on uh, ways to detect CWD in many different types of samples, and uh, trying to understand how the disease is spread amongst wild animals. So that still seems to be a mystery. We can't, um, can't really nail down a mechanism that seems to be most prevalent for how the disease spreads. It's, it's not apparent anyway. And, and that road took me down looking at some, looking at detecting CWD and excrete it. And uh, it was extremely challenging, the state of the science at the time I started. Um, there were only a handful of studies that had any indication that there may be CWD prions in urine. Um, so the test needed to be really sensitive because we assumed they were pretty low levels. Uh, so that's the type of test I worked on is an amplification test. Um, like PCR does for uh, viruses, if you've been familiar. It can take a very small signal present in the sample and amplify it to a level we can detect. And that's what this test does for prions. Uh, under normal detection methods, the prion disease or CWD would be undetectable in these samples. So the amplification brings it to a level where you can tell whether or not that sample may have had the ability to see CWD in another animal. And uh, what, what the main conclusion from those studies, looking at saliva, urine, and feces, was uh, it was pretty easy to detect in saliva. I mean, that, by easy, I mean the sensitive test's ability. It's, you could detect it by normal techniques in any saliva sample that I've ever seen. Um, and it was at, less, at lower levels in urine and feces. And uh, urine was the, urine and feces were about the same as far as levels. So they had a very low level between them. But the occurrence of positivity was higher in feces. So that's why I feel that feces should be ranked a little bit higher than urine as far as the, tech, as far as, uh, the risk factor because it's just detectable often. Um, and in all of these samples, we didn't really see positive seeding activity or the uh, presence of CWD until fairly late in the disease course. Um, usually, in, in these experimental studies, it's a little bit different, uh, difficult to, uh, to tell uh, what a natural disease course would be because the doses are, are significantly higher than what here we kind of in the wild, but you know, the 12 month period to the 24 month period is kind of where we would see uh, detection in, in, in uh, urine. So, uh, I'd also like to tell you a little bit about the animal bodies models, animal model studies that have been done prior to me entering this field. Um, they were actually also done at Colorado State University prior to getting there. The first one, uh, a study attempted to inoculate white-tailed deer with uh, saliva, blood, urine, and feces. And that study found that the deer did get sick from uh, inoculation by blood and also by oral inoculation of saliva. Uh, but there was a group of deer in that study that were inoculated with actually both urine and feces. And, and none of the deer in the 30-month course of that study got sick. Um, and that was a fairly large amount of urine, so we're talking um, 50, uh, 50 mils given multiple times, so approximately three to 500 mils. It's kind of hard for me to say a specific number because they're all done a little bit differently. I can't say exactly this much for each deer, but they were, they were given a, a, a fairly unnatural dose of urine and feces, and they did not become ill with CBD. So that uh, spawned another study from an author, uh, many of you, or maybe a handful of you may know, uh, Nick Haley is a, a creator researcher working on CWD resistance in deer, and he took uh, urine and saliva from CWD positive deer and uh, concentrated that tenfold to, to see if he could initiate infection even under those unnatural circumstances. So uh, he then took that urine and that was concentrated and resuspended in a different, a different solution that was safe to inject into the brain into transgenic mice. So 30 microliters of this concentrated urine was in, in, inoculated into the brains of these transgenic mice. And they were um, specifically engineered to get CWD because mice don't get it naturally. So they expressed the deer protein and uh, were given this dose of CWD. And, and they're also um, engineered to express more of that protein so they get sick faster. So they're kind of like a little tinderbox for CWD. If you give them any sort of tissue from a, from a positive deer, um, they're, they're prone to get sick, uh, especially injected in the brain. And so you found one of 10 mice in that study became sick with CWD. So that's the animal model, model study that has the strongest evidence that there are in infectious CWD preempts in urine. However, I would argue that those circumstances under those inoculation conditions do not reflect anything remotely possible in the natural setting. Um, so, let's see, where are we going here from there? All right, so uh, another important thing to consider with CWD is uh, it's not a homogeneous disease in, across tissues. The brain has extremely high levels by the time an animal reaches clinical disease where urine can have on the order of a million to 10 million fold lower levels. So a gram of brain could have 3,000 infectious doses for a deer by the oral route, where uh, it may take you know, more than this of urine directly given to one deer um, to, to get sick. So, 
Uh, the, the breaking of tissue positivity is the brain is at the highest. Lymphoid tissue, where the disease replicates early, is next. And then it becomes a little bit muddy in the middle because people don't study these tissues. But uh, digestive tissues, and then below that, uh, muscle, and then below that, um, infectivity. There would be blood, saliva, feces, and urine. And, and it's important to note that uh, deboned meat was injected into the brain of mice, just like I told you with the urine, and not concentrated or anything. And every single one of those mice have gone to CWD. So that suggests that the levels in muscle are significantly higher than in urine. And it's now legal in states that even ban urine products to transport in and out deboned meat. So, um, and I understand that there's obvious reasons why that would be not banned. But um, from a risk factor, deep bone meat has a significantly higher level of um, prions, and that's strongly supported in the literature. So um, there's been a number of things that have popped up. A lot of these I've, I've kind of touched on. Uh, this one, this book was um, in a document released recently, and it, it, it's talking about um, infectious doses are shed in urine over the course of the disease. And this is actually a book taken from one of my manuscripts. And it emits a couple of very important facts. So we were, we were referring to infectious doses for the transgenic mice that I told you about, intracranially inoculated with CWD. So to say that there are infectious doses for deer shed in urine, we don't know what that dose is. No one's been able to inoculate a deer with enough urine to get it safe. So uh, when, when someone makes a, a, a comment like this, and without the qualifications that were present in the manuscript, it, you know, it kind of takes it out of context. So we don't, we don't actually know how many infectious doses would be in, uh, shed in urine. And it actually, actually admits a very another critical thing. So these are um, LD50s, or 50% lethal dose shed. And that's typically how these things are referred to, is, is how much prion it would take to, to, um, to affect 50% of the animals in a group. Um, and, and this was, uh, again, for transgenically modified mice injected in the brain. So it doesn't really reflect um, the infectious doses for deer or what could be found in, in, in natural circumstances. So another comment um, that was made recently uh, regarding deer uh, in, in urine is that the, um, the way that it, the samples are collected, there could be a mixture of saliva and feces in these samples. And, and I, I mentioned earlier that the levels in saliva and feces are also really low. Um, so to, to, to say that saliva could potentially contaminate urine to make it dangerous doesn't really make a lot of sense because it's, it's only tenfold higher than urine, and urine is really low <laughs> in infectivity. So saliva, it, it takes about, we don't really have a, a hard number because it depends on the saliva sample, but 30 to 50 milliliters of saliva, which is, which is about three, uh, is that three one ounce bottles? Thirty, thirty, yeah, so about a bottle, so an entire bottle of, of, of deer urine product would have to be pure saliva, and that would have to be inoculated in the mouth of, of one specific deer to be near an infectious dose. Um, so that, that level of contamination of these products is just not possible by the way, the, um, the, the collection standpoint, from, from the way that samples are collected, the urine is collected. And, and again, feces, I mentioned that the infectivity is, is nearly um, the same as urine, and, and the way it's collected is not a major component for obvious reasons. They don't want feces getting into this product, so that there's a great which maintains a, a barrier from um, how the, the, uh, the when the urine is collected. So um, another point that uh, has come up is that um, that there's a possibility of environmental contamination of these products. So so if a person were to have their uh, one ounce bottle of urine and use it on the same tree every year that could, could create a reservoir for infection for CWD. So uh, the, the point would be contaminating it over and over with CWD would get, somehow get that level high enough to where if a deer licked that tree, you'd be in danger of that deer getting sick. So like I said, the levels are pretty low, and, and if it takes uh, 23 one ounce bottles, would be about one of these of urine, um, and typically about one bottle is used per year. So, so 23 years of, of, uh, of inoculating that same tree, and then you know, pouring hundreds of them I think hundreds of dollars worth of urine onto the same tree over and over again. Um, and the other point is that every single one of those bottles would have to be from a CDP positive deer. And that's just not the case with the monitoring programs that happen in these uh, elite facilities. So I think that is an argument is also not something I would think is supported by the scientific literature. Um, so one of the, uh, it's, it's also important to consider where these uh, bottles of urine and these products are coming from these retailers. They're, they're really um, from elite facilities um, that are monitored 100%. So any deer that dies in the, in the facility um, is, is tested if they're over 12 months of age and, and they're closed to the importation of, of animals. 
and uh, Steve's going to get into that a little bit more later, talking about the AT or deer protection program. And the most important thing to mention is that deer in these facilities, none of, the, none of these facilities have ever tested positive for CDBD. So the place the urine comes from is not a place that has CDBD, so the products do not contain CDBD, uh, yet they've been, they've been banned in, in numerous other states. And uh, one thing I forgot to mention on the previous slide I'd like to, like to say is that when, when you talk about deer urine being banned, uh, the, for example, the state of Arkansas has a deer urine lure ban, and they also have uh, CWD positive animals. They have um, uh, uh, deer and elk both positive in that state. So there are currently deer excreting quarts of urine in the state of Arkansas from, you know, potentially contaminated with CWD, yet the one ounce bottle is banned for, for 100 years. So, it just doesn't seem rational for me, to me um, for that to be taking place. So to, to kind of um, sum up what I've been talking about, um, the, 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 the essence of this, this problem is that um, the, the levels of, I've said this numerous times, I feel like, but the, the levels in urine are pretty low. And, and, and when I was talking about this in the manuscripts where environmental reservoirs and potential for CWD contamination uh, based on urine. It wasn't really in the context of a uh, bottle of urine. That actually, I didn't even really cross my mind until these guys called me up and asked me about it one day, and I said, no, that, that's not really what I meant. Um, the, 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 the problem in, in the environment and deer-to-deer -deer transfer is really on an environmental scale. So, so a herd of deer a, uh, with a high CWD prevalence, like we've seen in some of the states, in some of the counties of Wisconsin, the prevalence could reach 50%. So excreting urine and feces and and interacting with that environment with saliva, and then eventually decomposing on that landscape after succumbing to CWD. So the reservoir in the environment could be caused by many of these factors, we don't really know. But what we do know is that there are these environmental reservoirs. You can depopulate an area and take out all the deer and put them back, and they'll get CWD again. And that's because after a certain point, the environment is contaminated. And, and one of those supposed ways that could happen is through deer urine, but not from a bottle of deer urine. We're talking thousands of liters. Uh, from deer over the course of, of years or maybe even a decade to, to cause disease. Um, and and, and the, the other important factor there is, uh, oh, you want me to here? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, with the collection methods and the biosecurity measures, it seems um, that it's unlikely for the products to become contaminated with, uh, with saliva and feces. Um, and, and we know that the infectious dose in saliva is also uh, particularly high when we we're talking about uh, you know, one ounce bottle, percentage of that cannot possibly be 100% saliva, so therefore causing an infection through that route seems unlikely as well. Um, and like the environmental problem, we take thousands and thousands of bottles of this urine um, that would see to be positive to create an environmental reservoir that would be of a danger to deer. And that's, that's my um, opinion based on the, the scientific uh, evidence that I've, I've come up with so far. Um, and, and first of all, why would someone spend thousands of dollars spreading deer urine in a spot like that? Um, so I kind of just mentioned um, previously about the environmental contamination, but um, I, I think a larger source of environmental contamination is, is uh, the carcasses and whether or not those are transported um, mm -hmm. and just put out in the back 40 after a, a hunt in another state, um, which I knew has probably happened in the past um, in certain states, and whether or not that was a vector for spreading CWD or the deer in their natural environment dying of disease in the middle in the woods and decomposing to contaminate that environment. I think that poses an large risk, and, and transport of meat and carcasses is definitely a higher risk than deer deer. Um, so when you consider all the things we've told, told you today, um, the real life practical aspects of this problem, it, it just doesn't make sense. I think Phil said this earlier, he said, you can't say there's no risk, but that, at some point, I, he, he considered the risk something that could actually happen. So, you know, can this actually happen? Would it happen that deer urine in a bottle could cause CWD infection in a deer. Uh, I, I guess it doesn't seem possible to me. It's just the, the, the math doesn't make sense to me. So that's that's what I'd like to leave you with. Um, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about this problem, and and, and, I, and I've struggled to communicate that point sometimes when people can start talking too much about the science. Uh, but I think it's really important to know that um, there, there are people out there that, that are of the opinion that deer urine is not dangerous who know a lot about CWD. Um, and there seems to be a, a lot of another group of people who, who kind of consider all of the things that have CWD, like urine and saliva and brain, but all the same. But they're really not. The, the, the science does not support that urine is any danger when you consider uh, things like, like tissues or, or 
do both of them. Um, so in, in another um, development that I've been working on is, uh, is, is doing a, a research project um, which could develop a test for CWD in deer urine. And, and the test is based uh, exactly on the same test I used in the lab to look at it in the first place. So the studies that are cited to say that there's CWD in deer urine uh, use this technique and, and to do a test based on those same exact parameters and then say there's no CWD in deer urine, it seems as though that makes sense that, um, that uh, wildlife agencies and states would consider a test like that um, when, when considering the risk of, of deer urine. And this is a, a, just a, a little diagram of some data uh, from one of the manuscripts. And, and this is kind of what it looks like <laughs> when it's all done in a, in a pretty graph. But you know, there's lots of numbers that go into this. Um, and, and, and you can see from, from the, the far left, there's, there's a lot of dots above zero. And those are from animals that are at a later stage of disease or have a, a substantial CWD infection. And those were urine uh, samples that tested positive. And then it, it kind of marches down to animals that are a little bit, uh, or a little bit less positive. They may have actually been in the same later stage of disease, but the samples just didn't test as positive. And then um, when we compare that to animals that don't have CWD, we don't see that signal. So uh, the test is capable of detecting CWD in urine. And the most important thing that it could do is it could catch a batch that, for whatever reason, would have a higher level of CWD, and, and that would prevent that from entering the, the environment um, in these products. So, so I, I think it's an important measure to take, um, which, would, which would bring yet just another level of confidence for people in these products that they, they would be safe for the